Sunday, April 7, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a political strategist and commentator who has advised elected officials and campaigns at all levels of government and across the country. He has built a new home for his political analysis at Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Simon Rosenberg, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, undoubtedly, it's the climate has never, never been more uh, dramatic. Let's start with your New York Times article, though, which has yeah. sent shockwaves through much of Washington. <laughs> uh, the headline is, many Democrats are worried Trump will beat Biden. This one isn't, referring to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Just let's just react to to the article first before we get into the weeds of the news. Yeah, you know Adam Nagurney, who I've known, I think we met in the '92 campaign, um, is back with the Times. He's one of the most experienced political reporters in the country, and we've been talking a lot um, since he's returned to the Times. And you know, he reached out to me about a week ago and said, "Listen, I, I'd like to write a." You know, he said, "I talked to a lot of people, and you're remarkably more optimistic than everybody else." And I'm just kind of curious why. And so he said, can we do a sit down interview and, and for the times? And I said, sure. And it all came together very quickly. Um, and including them sending a photographer to my house, which was a little bit, cause I work out of my house. Here. It's a great and picture. By the way. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> uh, it was, a, I wanted to have my bulldog who's over my shoulder here somewhere. I mean, if you can see him there, he's, <laughs> let me, um, yeah. but he, we decided that he might eat the photographers and we didn't do that. But so just bottom line is that my take on where things are is that Joe Biden is a good president. The country's better off. The democratic party's strong, unified and winning elections all across the country. And, you know, they have Trump who's the ugliest political thing we've ever seen. And that, you know, when you push those things forward into a campaign that we should be able to win. And, 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 you know, what I've been saying also, there are two other kind of key points to the whole analysis. Number two is that, um, you know, I've been saying for months, and I think the campaign has been, I've been saying this, the campaign has been saying this, other people who are people in the business have been saying for months that our expectation was that once the general election began and the Biden campaign turned on, that a chunk of our wandering coalition, as I call it, would start to come home. And because there was no reason for them to be connected to Biden, there was no campaign. We weren't making the ask for them to be connected. And the truth is, a lot of Americans don't get up every day thinking about politics, thank God, right? They're worrying about Little League and getting their kids to school and all the other things we have to worry about. And so the expectation was, among all those of us who do this for a living, was that we would start to see an improvement in Biden's polling numbers as we started getting into the general election. And that's actually what's happened. I mean, he's clearly picked up two, three points. You know, there's a debate about how many, depends on where you were starting from. Um, he's now been consistently ahead in many, many polls taken over the last few weeks. Donald Trump is no longer ahead in this election. He's not leading. He's not favored. None of those things are true anymore. It's a close competitive election. But there now are a lot of polls showing Biden leading. Many, Almost every poll that came out this week, for example, showed him ahead. And we also have this other measure of the health of the Democratic Party called a congressional generic, which is the simple question of, are you voting Democrat or Republican for Congress? Right? It's a, it's a separate question. And it elicits different responses, right? It's an interesting thing. It's something we use as a measure. And that's improved over the last few weeks as well. So there's sort of a tandem movement where Biden's benefiting, the Democrats are getting stronger. So it looks like the race is changing and evolving as we expected it to. And I feel, you know, to some degree vindicated by the big argument I've been making about what would happen based on what we've seen. It doesn't mean it will continue. I mean, we have to wait every week, right? We have new data. But the third big argument in the piece and that I've been making, and this gets back to what happened with the red wave in 2022. And for example, you know, Jonathan Chait published a piece in New York magazine on Friday that was got all of this very confused, frankly, um, that in 2022, part of what Tom Bonnier and I did is that we said, there's a lot more information available to us than just polling, right? That you, you know, when you go buy a house, yes, the price matters, but so does its location. And 
the kitchen and how many bedrooms there are. I mean, whenever you buy anything or you do anything and assess the value of something or the performance of something, you don't look at one thing, right? You look at many things. And in politics, when you evaluate the health of a campaign or a party committee, you don't look at just the polling because the polling's close. It's not really telling you that much. We have a close election. Well, what other information is available to us? How much money are candidates raising? Their performance on the stump, the quality of the team they're building, the performance of the media, the arguments they're making, right? Their track record. I mean, all these other things go into, I mean, I had lunch with the woman who's running the DCCC this cycle, the House Campaign Committee, and we went through a lot of the races and polling was a very small part because in basically all those races, the races are close, right? So you're not, but we talked about the performance of the candidate in the stump and how telegenic they were and how are they doing as a candidate and how much money are they raising? And you look at all these other things. And so in 2022, we didn't center our understanding of the election around polling. We had all this other information. And what's happened is that there is this group of commentators and analysts who only look at polling, basically, who their entire and, – and, they're, they're, and I was on an interview with Cornell Belcher on Thursday at MSNBC, one of the most prominent pollsters in the Democratic Party. And he said, you know, you all are using polling completely wrong. It's not how polling works. And so all we're trying to do is to use all the tools that are in front of us, you know, to evaluate the health of the Biden candidacy. And as I said earlier, the way I evaluate it is that at the end of the day, he has been a good president. The country is better off. Um, we are in in so many different ways, um, you know, and and that his success as a president, and we saw the jobs numbers on Friday were another kind of unbelievable jobs report, that he's going to be able to run. I think the central contrast in this race that's going to become clearer and clearer is that Biden has been a good and successful president. He's earned, I think he's, I think many of the attacks against him have evaporated on the right, and that Trump is historically unfit. And and I think this contrast is going to become clearer and clearer to voters, which is why I am confident and optimistic that we should be able to win this election in November. Uh, I, I would agree in, in many ways. Um, I also always remind people that Trump hasn't won anything since 2016. Yeah. And, and you know, the only person that tells us that he is very popular is him. Uh, and so, you know, we can get caught up in, in his own self-publicity. But you're right. The points that you make are exactly right. And, and But I'm interested in the tools because we don't want to think that Democrats are doing better or Joe Biden is doing better because Trump is crashing and burning right. in his personal life and professional life and legal cases and, and right. you know, everything else. So, so what are the Democrats actually doing strategically right. that, is, that is giving them the, you know, this putting their best foot forward? Yeah. And, and, I, and I think you're right that in every endeavor in life, you want to win. You don't want the other team to lose. Right. And, and it's exactly you're, the way you're framing this is exactly is correct. Right. What are we doing to win and not what are we doing to let him lose the election? You don't want to win by default. But, right. When he's right. doing a lot to lose the election, by the way. <laughs> so I, I think he's doing his job in, in this in this thing. Um, listen, I think I think the. The biggest I, I, I've given talks over the last few days about this to various groups that I think that what is underestimated in our family right now is that we have this sort of big new muscle that we didn't have before. It's sort of our superpower, which is that the fear of loss of democracy, the the, the anger over Dobbs, um, the sort of just general outrage at the Republican awfulness has driven an extraordinary number of Americans to get politically active. Um, there's been sort of a renewal in our democracy. Heather Cox Richardson, Professor Richardson calls it, you know, she her book was called Democracy Revival, right? Or Renewal, uh, one of those two things. And I see it with my own eyes. I mean, I speak to these groups, as many of the people that fight, you know, are involved with Midas Touch, right, is that there is this sense of Americans who've decided to, worry, as I call it, worry less and do more. And and by doing more, it means, A, that our campaigns have more money than they've ever had. So we have the most robust, powerful campaigns that we've ever had. We're dramatically outraising Republicans in hard, what are called hard dollars, the money that goes into campaigns, not the super PAC money. And 
those large campaigns are allowing us to reach voters we could never reach before, right? Which is helping improve our performance in, in election after election. One of the reasons we're winning in all these off years elections is that we're our campaigns have so much money and are bigger and we're performing at the upper end of what's possible again and again and again. But those big campaigns are also creating the conditions for unprecedented volunteerism and citizen activism. There have been huge innovations in recent years accelerated by COVID where now Americans can stay engaged in life through Zoom or through events like this with a barrier to entry for meaningful engagement of discourse has been dramatically lowered, right? Second is that you can now make phone calls and text into and reach voters from anywhere in the country. I mean, you know, and in the Tom Swazi New York race in New York 3, which we were all told was a bellwether, and it was a race that it was a bellwether until we won, by the way. But it was a bellwether that, you know, we were winning by two to three points where we won by eight. Part of the reason that we did so well was because we made two million phone calls to voters in New York three in five weeks. Two million phone calls would be the number of calls we'd make into Michigan in the entire general election, you know, four years ago, eight years ago, right? The scale of that is just, it's unbelievable. The second thing is every household in that district, Democratic household, got um, a, a handwritten postcard um, and, you know, uh, five, got five handwritten postcards. So the level of our ability now to touch voters, low propensity voters, to turn them into voters for us to, to give is unprecedented. And you're seeing now again and again and again, heightened Democratic performance because of this sort of explosion of citizen engagement, which has been dramatically um, bolstered by Dobbs and by the abortion extremism. I mean, many of these people who are doing this work, who are dedicating 10 hours a week to making phone calls or writing postcards all over the country every single week, right, are older women, right, who are horrified that on their watch that rights and freedoms of, of women have been stripped away, scared about the future of their democracy, scared about their kids and their grandkids and the world they're going to live in. And they're busting their ass. And, you know, we're a very hungry party right now. I'm not worried at all about intensity in 2024. We've been bringing it. We brought it in 2018. We brought it in 2020. We brought it in 2022. We brought it in 2023. And we're going to bring it again in 2024. Um, and so I think that for me, tactically, right, which is part of what you're getting at, there's been an extraordinary evolution of our politics in recent years that is not well understood, where now the Biden campaign isn't going to be, you know, 300 field organizers in, in Michigan. It's going to be two to three million people going to work every day, helping advance Biden's politics. You know, sort of as I talk about it, we have to reimagine the war room, in essence, where it's not 20 sweaty kids drinking Red Bulls you know, producing TikTok videos. It's two to three million proud patriots who love their country, who are taking steps every day to advance democratic politics. And I think that to me, that's part of the reason we've been winning these places where we weren't supposed to be winning the recent elections um, and why it's a central reason why I'm so confident. I would say the second thing is the thing I'm very encouraged by, in addition to the Biden campaign, you know, gearing up and staffing up, A, their media has been very good. It's been, you know, high quality, I think, also connecting to the voters that actually the voters that really care about every single video the Biden campaign has produced going back over the last 12 months, I felt was good. That's not usually the case. Right. It's right? certainly more edgy, yeah. isn't it? They're, they're yeah. actually trying no, they're to inject some humor and. To- well, that's the second piece. Then let's talk about that. So okay. there's the first of all is the TV ads, the 30 second spots, which yeah. are and then the sort of gauzy videos, right, that are, you know, setting up the two to three minute videos with flags and all that stuff. I will just say that in general, I'm a t- former TV producer and writer. I know you come from the media business. The quality of the stuff they've been producing, and I think also the emotional appeal has been really like at the upper end. I've been super impressed. And I'm I'm a little bit of a critic on those things, right? And And I've been, and in part, this is because we have so much money now that we can spend more money in making high quality media, right? Then we, and, and have more, you know, so, but the second thing that you're getting at is this more rapid response kind of Midas touchy kind of stuff, right? Yep. That stuff has been amazing and they are pioneering completely new video based rapid response. We've never done the 
Democrats have never done anything on this in the scale in which they're doing this right now. The frequency, the volume, the edginess, the interest, the kind of, and it's clear that, you know, the team in the Biden campaign has been given an enormous amount of running room to innovate, to try things, to do new cheeky things, right? And it's just, and which is what you have to do in a campaign. In a campaign, you have to let go. You cannot, you know, you can, I've worked in two presidential campaigns. I've been involved in campaigns for 30 years. You can hold things too tight. And, and you know, the Hillary campaign in 2016 to me was a campaign that held things a little bit too tight. It is amazing that Biden at his age, running as an incumbent, the sitting president, has a campaign that's innovating and pioneering new kind of ways of communicating democratic, you know, stories and narratives and bloodying Trump, right? And roughing him up, I think, every day. Really encouraged by that. It's, to your point, it's given a sense of fight that we all want. You know, I think the big question about Biden, to me, among Democrats, wasn't his age. It was about, did he have the fight to go beat Trump? I think they're answering that through the State of the Union. And through this very hyper aggressive kind of forward leaning media that we're seeing come out. And, and unless you're on social media every day, you may not yet be seeing it, right? If you're not, somebody, folks who are watching tonight, listening tonight, may not have seen some of this stuff. But for those of us who are in the daily scrum, what they're doing is super impressive. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, frankly, it was unexpected to me that they would be this far along in this aspect of the campaign this early. And it's something that is is another reason why I'm very encouraged about where we are right now. One thing I think is missing, and it maybe it just hasn't happened yet, is a, an exposure of his truly young, diverse cabinet. Because, you know, I, I always try to remind people, especially when they're critical of Biden's age or his you know, speech or, you know, whatever. I'm like, you're not voting for Biden. You're voting for democracy. And, and, you know, this is an essential election from that perspective. And really, the way I would look at it is that the Democratic leader should be relatively interchangeable when democracy is at stake. And would you, would you think that they should be doing more to highlight and platform so, the cabinet who so are, who are the, diverse? There are legal limitations to some of that, right? And, yeah. you know, um, the cabinet can't, you know, there are... The way that I think this is going to work for your, you know, for your audience here is that there's going to be a division of labor. And it's one another reason why I'm optimistic, which is that Donald Trump has very limited capacity at this point to generate positive news about himself. Virtually all the news that's being generated about him is negative. And even the positive news is if he gets, you know, Judge Cannon to delay thing for two days, it's still bad that he's on trial for essentially the equivalent yeah. of treason. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there is, he's got, he's got a really big structural problem in that he can't generate positive stories about himself. Uh, and Biden can, because Biden has the white house and he's got this massive apparatus that has, is going to be spending an enormous amount of time, communicating every day to voters, as they should, by the way. I mean, when you're in government, you have an enormous obligation to explain to the American people about what you're doing with their money and with their trust. And you're going to see, I think, the diverse cabinet that you're describing be very aggressive about communicating what they've accomplished through the government, but not through the campaign. The campaign is going to be a separate operation. And I will say that the point you're raising, I think, is really important for your audience because I view Biden in some ways as sort of the chairman of the board and that and that the party, the 25, 30 leaders of the Democratic Party, Pete Buttigieg, Kamala Harris, Gavin Newsom, Gretchen Whitmer, you know, out, uh, Hakeem uh, Jeffries, Hakeem Jeffries, go down, make your own list. Right. Yeah. This team is the strongest kind of next team the Democratic Party's had since I've been in the business since the 1980s. I don't know that we've had. This, you know, I was on James Carville's podcast recently, and he went on and on about this. I've known James since the campaign in 92. And I was like, James, I violently agree with you on this. We don't talk about this enough. I mean, the quality and the depth and talent the Democratic Party has versus, by the way, the Star Wars bar, um, Republican yeah. debates yeah. that we saw, yeah. 
right? Yeah. Where there were lots of people with things pointing, sticking out of their head and, you yeah. know, all the things. Like you put up their next generation against ours. And it's another reason to be deeply optimistic that when we win this election, that we have the possibility, right, of being in power for a very long time. Um, because we have, we're a modern party that's adapting to the challenges in front of us. We keep winning elections. We're governing well. This is the third Democratic presidency in a row where we've made things far better. The last three Republican presidents have created recessions and higher deficits and created American decline. And the last three Democratic presidents have created growth and higher wages, higher incomes, and lower deficits in American progress. And this contrast between the sort of modern party with forward looking leaders, who are connected to voters, who are not, you know, who are pra pragmatists, who are getting things done for the American people versus this other party, which has been overtaken by extremists and extremism, again, is another contrast that I think is going to become clearer to voters. But it's also deeply structural. They, the Republicans are facing, you know, what are truly profound structural problems, right? The, you know, Dobbs and post-Dobbs is you know, those are the kind of mistakes that can keep a party out of power for 25 years. Trying to overturn an American election can keep a party out of power for a long time. I mean, the party of Reagan and, and Lincoln is now going to forever also be the party of insurrection. And, have, and also, I'd yeah, say that yeah. the candidates that Trump is endorsing, yeah, this is a repeat of the midterms where yep. he was literally supporting crackpots and lunatics yep. and people that didn't really stand a chance of winning, but because they pledged their allegiance to him, yeah. he, he's, his ego was inclined to support them. You no, know, what's happening is, is that, and look, I've been part of the Democratic Party for a long time and we're, you know, we have our own, you know, challenges, the big, happy, dysfunctional family, the Democratic Party, which today is actually, frankly, remarkably functional and very unified, you know, compared to the past. But you know, I what is happening is that the el the elevation by Trump of extremists and crackpots is causing regular Republicans to flee, and and creating a brain drain, if you want to call it that. It's creating, you know, it and it's creating a disincentive for young, competent Republicans to run for office, or to you know, and what you're the evidence of this is the the fleeing from the House. Yes. That we're seeing right now, which I, you know, I've been here in Washington for 32 years. We've never seen anything like this. The kind of ban, you know, this people are not just not running for re-election; they're quitting and giving two weeks' notice. But they're too <laughs> nervous like, to stand up to Trump, aren't they? So their only option is to just disappear into no, the night. They don't feel like that this party is a party they can be part of any longer. Yeah. And and th this is something that I think that in the national media understanding of the moment. Is where, you know, I, I said in the Adam Nagurney piece that the mistake that keeps getting made by the media is they underestimate our strengths and overestimate theirs. Yes. Right. One of the areas where I think there is a dramatic underestimation of the significance is of the splintering of the Republican Party. And and I think that which had already happened in 2020, right? You know, we all sit here and it's normal that Joe Scarborough, former Republican, is a former Republican, Nicole Wallace, former Republican, right? The whole bulwark crowd and the Lincoln Project people. And, you know, the idea that there is a, per, a entire category on our television every night of former Republicans and former chairman of the Republican Party, Mitt Romney, former nominee, not supporting Joe Biden, the former vice president of the United States, two former vice presidents of the United States, Republicans not supporting, I mean, uh, Donald Trump, right? This is unprecedented. There's nothing like this has ever happened. I mean, you know, if you grew up in a parliamentary democracy system, these things were more common where a party could splinter, new parties emerge. We don't have that system here. We only have two parties by law, by the way, by statute. It's kind of a crazy system. We should probably just mention that no labels have just announced that they're not going to put yeah. up a candidate. And, and, when, and, the, and when asked who they would vote for, said Joe Biden, Joe Biden <laughs> right, over because, Donald Trump. Because, because look, I, th I think the reality is, is that starting a third party in this country is very difficult. And the truth is, if we had an easy mechanism of starting parties, Liz Cheney, Mitt Romney, and, and you know, all those bulwark Adam Kinzinger. Yeah, would have started a new center-right party that would have been fighting against the nationalist, you know, party to their right. But we, our system doesn't work that way. And for those of you who are involved in this pro-democracy movement, 
what you're aware of, of what we're trying to fashion here is this temporary pro-democracy coalition that is neither left nor right, but is this big tent effort that would pull, you know, imagine what happens in this election if, if in the final two weeks, Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney and Adam Kissinger and Bill Kristol and all these folks are openly campaigning with Joe Biden, the permission structure that we'll give for Republicans to abandon Trump will be extraordinary. That, that's and, interesting. And, so it just needs one to really start the exodus and then others will follow. But it's already happened, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the point is that this is now a reality and and that Mitt Romney has said he's not supporting Donald Trump. Liz Cheney already campaigned against MAGA in the last election in ways that were consequential in the election, in my view, right? Because the the, per, the terminology we use when you talk about tactics, right, is is permission structures that that get created in politics. The permission structure for Republicans to not vote Republican is going to in this election is going to dwarf the permission structure that existed in 2020 and 2022. And I can tell you from conversations I've had and meetings I've had on the campaign, the campaign has already produced an ad telling Haley voters that Donald Trump doesn't want them in his coalition, but we do, right? So they understand at a strategy level, you know, part of, I wrote a memo a year ago called Get to 55, where I made the argument that it was possible for us to get to 55% in this election and win the election by eight to 10 points because of their escalating extremism, that more was possible for us, right? They were moving further and further away from the electorate and that we had to under recognize this and have the ambition of being able to get to 55. You can't get to 55 by stumbling forward. There needs to be a strategy that gets you there. And I laid out in this memo a whole strategy and the core of it though was about recognizing this Republican splintering that had taken place and doing something unusual in our politics, which is trying to bring people from the other party into your coalition, which again, as we discussed, I mean, for those of you who grew up in a parliamentary system, these kinds of things aren't crazy, but they are unusual in our system and, 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 and hard structurally to do. But the Biden campaign has a whole team working on this. They've indicated clearly this is a major priority for them. As they should be, because I do think that, you know, between the threat to democracy, Dobbs, this the general boorishness, buffoonishness, awfulness, insulting nature of who Trump is, convict, you know, adjudicated rapist, fraudster, stole America's secrets, led an insurrection against the United States, taken more money from foreign governments than anyone. In yeah. American history. And he's All now going to be things. in trouble over his the share price of, of his the share media price, empire. which you guys have done, minus touch has done a phenomenal job yeah. in sort of explaining how to, he's not only over the share price, he's being sued. Like he's had people already convicted of crimes. I mean, yeah. this is the most crime ridden startup like in the history of the, of the world, right? <laughs> yeah. And 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 it's so Trumpian, right? Like it's, I mean, it's such a farce that this even happened. I still can't believe the SEC approved it. Yeah. So he's got a whole new set of crimes he's committing yeah. right in front of our eyes, right? And I just think there's a part of the Republican Party. I mean, my view is that that a big chunk of the Republican Party, that Dobbs broke the Republican Party, that for a big chunk of the Republican Party, this was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is too far. It's too much. Yeah. And a big chunk of the Republican Party has become loosened from the Republican Party. We'll get some of it. Some of it will stay home. Some of it will vote for Trump. But the size of that splinter and the size of the never the concerned about Trump Republican who ends up voting for us will depend in part by how hard we work and how much work and how comfortable we make it so that when we explain that at our dinner table, there is a seat for never Trumpers and that it's actually the head of the table and not at the not on the kids table, but it's in the head of the table and they're yeah. going to get all the same food that you and I get to eat. Right. That will make a difference in how big the, the coalition really becomes, you know. We have to take a quick break, but I, I want to come back and talk to you about the rhetoric over immigration, which is a kind of winning topic for Republicans. We'll do that next. With for, for, now, for now. For <laughs> now. For now. Okay. <laughs> I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. 
Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips, and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. Now, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony and use code Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. We all hate wasting food. Now, nothing is ever wasted thanks to Lomi. I have a Lomi and it's changed the way I think about my food waste. Lomi transforms my trash into treasure at the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into plant food in four hours. There's no rotting food in my garbage and smelling up the kitchen now. I only take the trash out on garbage day. Plus, no more leaky bags. I turn my waste into nutrient-rich loamy earth that I can feed to my plants, lawn or garden instead of sending it to the landfill. I can help the environment and make my life easier. All my food scraps, plant clippings and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge can go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food at home. And now Lomi's new app lets me track my environmental impact, earn points for every cycle and redeem freebies from Lomi plus other great brands. I learned that food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint. By reducing the amount of food I send to landfill, I'm helping do my part for the planet. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use the promo code weekend to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use promo code weekend at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. We're back with Simon Rosenberg here on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Uh, Simon, the the misinformation machine is in full swing, undoubtedly coming from the Republican side. Uh, you know, the, 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 their propaganda has has not slowed down. And for Republicans who do live in that information silo, they see a very different political landscape yeah. than the one that you and I have been discussing. Yeah. In fact, they think that that Joe Biden is going to step down, Kamala Harris is going to take over, <laughs> Gavin Newsom is going to be vice president, and they're going to pardon Joe Biden for his crimes. I, I, I that, that is I, first-hand information well, from a I, Republican friend I think, I think friend the other Obama. version of that is that Michelle Obama is actually going to come in yeah. and, and be well, the candidate. Great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not? Why, why not? Yeah. You have a tough job convincing her. But there are some serious issues, and that is that immigration is a, is a huge topic for Republican voters. And even though statistically joe biden has deported more people than donald trump did and has a a better record on the border it doesn't that the visuals which republicans love they love the photo op down at the southern border and all that stuff the visual doesn't quite match the rhetoric so what what are what are democrats doing yeah. to address this issue i i want to if you don't mind i'd like to air this out a little bit because yeah. this is a, an issue that i've actually worked on as a, at a policy level for 20 years i'm a subject matter expert on immigration and border issues and u.s mexico relations and so on i'm not a subject matter expert on many things but this is one of them and I, I think that, and I also have worked politically on this. I mean, I ran the first Spanish language media campaign ever run by a democratic organization. And I helped invent bilingual polling. And so I've been around these things for 20 years. 
What's very important to start with politically is that immigration is, for most voters, a second-tier issue. It is a primary issue for Republican-based voters, but for most voters, economy, health care, foreign policy, security, these things matter much more. And what has historically been the case is that when Republicans have tried to turn this into a top-tier issue, it's failed for them. It failed for them in 2006. It failed for them in 2018 when Trump spent the last month of the election talking about the caravans. Um, it has historically failed because it's seen as sort of, yes, it matters, but there are these other things that matter more. And when Republicans try to make it a primary issue, it actually in some ways becomes not just like what – it becomes a little bit of like, what are you doing, Right. Um, you know, what about all these other things? And and it continues to underperform in the broader electorate. And the way I like to say this is that it's an important issue, but for many voters, there are other issues that matter more to them, right? Number two, the um, on, on the issue of, of immigration and the border historically is that I think that they are this idea that they had an opportunity to pass this bill and they've now decided that they want chaos instead of, you know, order at the border and that we're now the party of order at the border and they're the party of chaos is not something that is that, you know, we actually litigated this in the New York three special election with Tom Swazi and the Republicans, you know, ran that entire election. The Republicans ran on immigration and New York, you know, New York has had immigration problems. And we won that election by eight points. And again, because it gets to this basic idea that, you know, if you're that concerned about immigration, then what are you doing to fix it? And it's unsustainable for them, in my view, to be in this place where they actually don't want to fix it. I, and, and I think, by the way, this is an easy thing to argue. This is not complicated. Like, yeah, I agree with you. It's a big problem. We have a plan, bipartisan. We want it. And Trump wants to keep the border open. I think over time, that's an unsustainable position for them. And we'll see how it goes. I mean, I understand there's not unanimity in the family about how this evolves over time. But I actually think that the, for most voters, going back 20 years on immigration, the way voters have viewed this is that this thing's a mess. Will you just go fix it? They don't have very strong views about it. It's like stupid and messy. Can't you government? Can't you guys make government work? So Trump is walking right into the wrong place on this issue for the overwhelming majority of voters, which is, this is messy, go fix it. We're the messy, go, we're the, we're going to go fix it party now. And they're the, like, we want to keep it messy problem party. That's not a good place to be in this issue. I'll just tell you. And then finally, and I want to speak to you just given your, you know, given that you're an immigrant to the United States, it's my view that Trump's obsession with immigration has been driven in part by the fact that America first, in my view, is a European import. That it was, this is politics that was developed in the early part of the last decade based on the Syrian migration and the exodus from the Syrian civil war into Europe. Um, that the, and that Russia kept that Syrian civil war open as long as possible to keep the flow of, of immigrants into Europe to sort of fuel the rise of right-wing parties and one of the casualties of all that was Brexit, right? And in my view, and that the problem with this, is, and so this issue, this kind of strategy has worked in Europe. It hasn't worked here because we have a different relationship to immigration than Europe does. We're a nation of immigrants. People look at immigrants very differently here than they do in Europe and, um, and in many European societies, right? And so I think this has been one of the miscalculations of greater MAGA, that the issue around immigration, which is central to MAGA's cousins in Europe, has never been, the, has never produced for them in the way that they want. And, and, and it is foundational, right? It is foundational to greater MAGA, what I call greater MAGA, to the Putin-allied right-wing politics in, in Europe and here in the United States, which I think is one kind of ideological movement with Orban and so on, right? And it just never work. It's never going to work for them the way it did in Europe because of the nature of our history with immigration. And so I, I'm not worried about this issue. I, I think that to me, what 
I think when we, after we win this election, we're going to go back and look at Joe Biden's steady negotiation with Republicans to get a sensible immigration deal where he made major concessions to them. And the fact that they we were able to actually get a bipartisan bill in, introduced in the Senate was a masterstroke by Joe Biden. This is where Joe Biden, the legislator, the most experienced guy to ever get in the White House, essentially turned the tables on Trump and called them out. Yeah. And Trump then, would, and I think what was a catastrophic error, like rejected the deal. And because in his sick mind, right, he thinks that he's going to be able to run and all these, you know, run around the country and talk about all these immigrants that have committed crimes. Yeah. He, and yet we litigated this in New York <laughs> 3, right? Be. And it yeah. blew up on them, right? Like we already had a test of this mm -hmm. in New York 3 and it completely mm -hmm. failed for them. And I think it will fail for them again. However, like every issue, if it goes unmanaged, it can blow up on us. And the team Biden is, is obviously very front leaning now on this and is not running away from it and has a strategy. And so far it's working, but we got a lot. This is something we have to keep our eyes on. But I think that if in the final month of the election, if Donald Trump is still doing events with victims of immigration families, we're going to win this election by 10 points. In my yeah, that was, that was not a, no, it wasn't a good day for him that, that day. Um, Particularly Finally, when he lied and made up all this Yeah, time. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's the thing is with the blatant lying being contradicted by video evidence, and in this case, yeah. the actual family kind of going on local news and saying he never he never spoke to us, it, is it, it really puts his lies front and center. It calls him out in the moment, as opposed to you know waiting weeks and months for, for evidence. And I think that that can only be a good thing. I, I just finally want to talk about election yeah. interference because. Aside from your article in the New York Times, there was another article, believe it or not. The headline was China's <laughs> advancing efforts yeah. to influence the U.S. election raise alarms. Um, we know about how the Kremlin influenced in, in 2016 and is undoubtedly still doing that stuff, uh, despite Putin's denials that he wanted Trump to win. But of course, that's where they're going. But when it comes to China, they also have a vested interest in 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 this election as well. Everybody has a vested interest in Trump winning all around the world, yeah. except for Europe, right? So, so yeah. just talk, just talk to us about the outside influence and also how it might affect, in combination with the Electoral College, which is also stacked yeah. against Democrats. So, so it is as you are aware, probably that in Europe there's a much more advanced discussion around these matters. Um, you know, where they have this concept of hybrid war, right, which doesn't really exist in American English. We don't have an, an analogous sort of understanding of the, the modern nature of warfare and conflict yeah. where... And they are panicking in Europe right now. I mean, yeah, gen gen no, no. genuinely. I know. Trust me. I mean, I, I Christian Amanpour had me on a CNN international interview recently in order to sort of calm everybody down, yeah. you know, and... Um, and I'm, in, you know, I'm in touch with European friends and I'm aware of this, right? I'm aware of the, but but I But I think... I think that one of the, if I could wave a magic wand and, and, and change, you know, if I had a handful of things I could change, one of them would be for us to develop some kind of vocabulary and understanding around that is the American equivalent of the hybrid war conflict where conflicts now happen in, you know, are deeply happening in the information space. And I think that we are not, we're behind on this a little bit as a conceptual Thing and I also think we our government is very um, handicapped in their ability to engage in this because of the First Amendment, which doesn't exist in Europe, for example, um, and and also um, because in our establishment, our security establishment, there is this incredibly bright line between foreign and domestic, um, which is proving to be very difficult to overcome uh, on this matter because when the disinformation comes, it's very hard to attribute it to a foreign source, right? And so we're just in a place where at some point there's going to be a whole of society government response to the degradation of our information environment. But it isn't going to happen before this election. <laughs> you know? And and there's a much bigger set of challenges around privacy and what Elon's doing with Twitter that we all have to have a big conversation about, you know, in America, um, which we're not having. It's not a central part of the conversation. So having said all that, I, th I have two observations. One is that the response as citizens and as Democrats to all this is that we have to get louder. The louder we are, the more space that we're taking up, the harder it is for these malign 
in influences to have an impact. You know, part of the reason Hillary's campaign, I think, got a little bit more pushed around on this was the campaign wasn't as loud as it needed to be. So the more money that we raise, the more ads we put in the air, the more aggressive Biden HQ is on social media, the more that we're all amplifying and tweeting and you're reaching more and more people, the louder our collective voice is, the harder it is for outside manipulation to have the kind of impact it would have, right? And that's so number one is you have to go on offense. The best way to deal with this stuff is to be louder and go on offense, which I think we're doing, but we need, everyone has to recognize who's who's in, a, in the audience tonight that, you know, think of yourself as running an information age victory garden, right? You need to be spreading good information about Joe Biden and the Democrats through your networks as much as possible to be louder, to help reduce the ability for outside malign influence to happen in the United States. But the second thing is that we, and, and we need to grow Midas Touch and Courier Newsroom and Deep State Radio and My Hopium Chronicles, right? But the second thing is that we have to really collectively, and I'm going to be talking to Ben about this soon, really start to challenge the media to have a self-awareness that they are actors in this play. And that, and I'll give you one example, right? Last week when Trump, something was happening with Trump, I read a news account that Trump supporters online were very irate about something. And reporters can't claim they're Trump supporters unless they individually validate every single account on social media to be an actual person. They have to use the term Trump accounts, not Trump supporters. And yeah. that's something that we can do together. We have an obligation, those of us in this pro-democracy media space, to put pressure on the media to not be, to not walk into and be complicit in the way they were in 2016 and spreading daily the WikiLeaks stuff that we all knew was coming from Russia. There has to become greater self-awareness of their role as an actor in the play, right? And to not willingly fall into traps that are going to come. Um, and, and I think that's something that we can achieve. I think that's an achievable thing. Finally, what are we going to do about AI? And, and, and what I worry most about AI is not uh, radio, you know, audio or video fakes. I worry just about volume and, and yeah. about the ability of AI to overwhelm and to create a an awareness of something that becomes impossible to unpack out of people's heads, right? Which is a volume thing. It's not a. It's and and I worry about that, and I don't know what to do about that yet. You know, I I don't. I'm, well, this is an area does. that I'm it's... actually going to begin to start spending more time on. Yeah. Now, uh, and and but it's an enormous challenge we have. And, and and just very finally, the the media is still much of the media, mainstream included, is still sticking to this template of two horse race. They don't seem to be talking about the loss of democracy, the rise of fascism, the fact that you might never get to vote ever again if Donald Trump wins. When are they going to wake up to the fact that they have a much more important role to play here? I, I mean, given the fact that allies of Trump have talked about jailing and killing members of the media, one would assume that people in the media would be a little bit more attuned to all right. this, right? Right. But I was asked by Adam, what am I worried about? Because my whole thing is I'm not worried, right? Like I'm confident and strong. And and I and and what I, I said, there are two things that actually I said, given the fact you've pestered me on this, I actually have to give you an answer. Right? I can't just mm -hmm. say I'm not worried. That would seem ridiculous. And I said, number one is I wish I'm worried that the campaign started a little bit late and they're having to do a lot of things really quickly and running presidential campaigns is really hard under the best of circumstances. And they're going to have to do a lot in a slightly compressed time frame, And and that worries me, but it's also, it's here and there's nothing we can do about it. But I said, the second thing that worries me more than anything else is the consistent normalization of Trump's extremism and awfulness by the media. And that I, it, I'm i at a point as somebody who is a former journalist, I worked for ABC News in my early days, that we're at a point in this that I really do believe that it is almost, it's hard to even believe the, the normalization ma machine that exists in mainstream media. It's as if the media's central job now is to normalize Trump yeah. and to make him look like a presidential candidate as opposed to the the ugliest political thing that any of us have ever seen in our lifetime, right? Which is what he actually is, right? And and that, you know, he goes through this transformation and this laundering by the national media. 
And I even, I, I had an opportunity to, I was doing a TV hit and there was a journalist there who had been on before me who had been talking about the Mar-a-Lago documents case. And she came out and I said, do you mind if we have a chat for a minute? And I said, why do you call it the Mar-a-Lago documents case, right? What's the, isn't it in, in about classified documents and isn't it about him stealing documents? It's Espionage. Not really, yeah. Right. It, it's not really about Mar-a-Lago and it's not really about documents. It's about him betraying the country and committing what may be the largest national security breach in the history of the Western world. And, you know, go down the list. Like there's a lot of other ways for you to characterize this. And it seems like saying that it's the Mar-a-Lago documents case that you're actually making a massive in-kind contribution to the Trump campaign. This was an interesting conversation, one could imagine, right? And I think that it's things like that, that we, us, all of us, there are things like that where I think we can make a difference. We're not going to be able to have a different media in the next six months in the United States. It's not going to happen. However, just getting things, it was interesting, like later in this same broadcast, a, an anchor referred to this as the classified documents case. That was a little better, right? Um, I'll take that. And um, But I think we have work to do. This is an area where us collaborating together, we can make marginal gains on this stuff. I think if we can talk to, you know, have a system of, of challenging people who are on air, who are speaking to large numbers of people, to use language that's more accurate, right? And because Mar-a-Lago documents case, I would argue, is almost a euphemism. <laughs> it's almost yeah. like, I don't even know what the right word for it is. It, it's, it's so, it's such a, a softening and laundering of the actual crime that it's almost like they're talking about something other than what happened. It could be like yeah. the Mar-a-Lago party that happened on Tuesday night, right? It right. has like this sense of innocence about it. That's a form of self-censorship, right? And we, we who are not part of that world, have to engage that world in this conversation in a respectful manner, right? Not in a, God damn it, why do you keep doing this crazy stuff? But recognizing that a lot of people who are caught in this bubble want to get out of the bubble themselves. And I think could view this as being helpful to them, actually, as opposed to being annoying. Because I believe that 98% of the people that we see on television and we read in newspapers want to do the right thing. And, and that we, our job should be to help them do the right thing. And I think this is an area of opportunity for us. I think this is another area. I'm very big on do, right? Like what can, practically what can get done as opposed to bitching and moaning about stuff. <laughs> and I think this is an area where we actually could see if we're smart and we work together, we could see significant improvement on getting journalists to question, you know, am I really, is this fair? Calling it the Mar-a-Lago Mar Mar documents case, in my view, is not fair and accurate. I think it's, yeah. it is a slant. And we have to challenge them in a way. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this person who said this today, said this the other day, is reflecting upon that now um, and wondering whether or not there's a better and more artful and accurate way to describe the stakes of what we're describing here. Because... I believe that that was such a, a laundering or such a softening mm -hmm. that it almost gets to a place of inaccuracy, right? Um, and where it becomes unrecognizable to the original sense. It's been happening for years in as much as the media has been, they misquote Trump to make his language sound more um, fluid. So if they actually quoted him verbatim, you wouldn't be able to read what he, he had well, said because it doesn't make any and, sense. And so they've been I've, rewriting his speeches for years. I, I, the, I had an amazing moment in this, in my own evolution of my thinking about this, a few about six weeks ago when I was on with Ben and Brett on Midas Touch, when they actually showed clips of Trump speaking at events that I had not watched, right? Because okay. I don't spend a lot of my time watching Donald Trump. I'd rather do a lot of other things. Do anything. Life, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Do anything. <laughs> Listen to my dog bark. Right. Um, and I, I will be honest with you. I was flabbergasted. Like I was, we were on air. Right. Yeah. And they came out of the clip and I think Ben said to me, what do you think? And I'm like, Ben, I can't even believe what I just watched. Yeah. I mean, it's he's incoherent. so diminished 
and impulsive. Look, the the, the fundamental, another reason I'll, let's close on this, is that okay. a fundamental, there are many reasons why I think we're going to win. One of the probably top 10 in the top 10 is that, you know, I had a, a niece who worked in a dementia ward at a nursing home. And one of the things she talked about is how dementia patients have wild impulsivity issues, right? They run around naked. They copulate, you know, in, in their, in their rooms, right? There's yeah, no inhibitions. Inhibit, yeah. It's inhibitions, impulsiveness. Yeah. Trump is exhibiting wild levels of impulsivity. Right. Right. I mean, like wild off the chart. He is uncontrolled. They can't trust him. They've cut back his public events. They're doing more pre-cut videos of him. Right. Because he is exhibiting, in my view, and others have said this too, yes. early signs of what are all of the con- in- rising impulsivity levels is a universal sign of mental decline, right? Yeah. And he's got it like in spades and way beyond where he was in 2020. I mean, I was on a, 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 one of these podcasts where one, the, one of the guests was a former, somebody who worked for Trump and said, in 2016, he was wildly disciplined. He never spoke out of school. It's one of the reasons he got elected. Like they yeah. shut him up. He just stuck to the script. There's no script anymore. No, he has no inner monologue. Yeah, there's no inner monologue. And 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 you know what? As having worked in politics, it's really like super bad because <laughs> he's making crazy mistakes and saying crazy things in every event. And so all of a sudden, Trump's kind of macho persona rather than being an asset, has become a massive liability for them. And then the, the question is, what's the what do they have? Like, what are the assets on their campaign? I don't think they have any. And, you know, and other than maybe having Russia and China helping them, right? I mean, this is like the worst campaign we've all ever seen in our lifetime. It's the ugliest political thing we've ever seen. So what I just want to close with is, look, we got a long way to go and a lot of work to do, but I'd much rather be us than them seven months out. And I'd like to, I'd much rather be us than them on so many different levels, moral levels, right? Policy levels, you know, our, our uh, conviction and fight for democracy, the fact that we're building a bottom up grassroots led politics and not one that's funded by oligarchs, right? In all these ways, the Democratic Party right now is a remarkably virtuous force for good in America, fighting against a party that has truly lost its way and become something dangerous and dark. And it's why we're all here, and it's why we're all going to leave it all in the playing field and win this election in November. Okay. It's a great place to finish. Simon Rosenberg, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Anthony. Okay, bye-bye. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. Download the 5-Minute News podcast and join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss here on the 5-Minute News weekend show with Midas Touch.